The life that you get in Jesus Christ becomes yours the moment you trust him. And then it lasts forever. So if it's going to last forever, time has past, present, and future. In the past, phase one of salvation is our justification. When we're made righteous, the righteousness of God, God made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, that moment, you're taken out of Adam, you're placed into Christ, and everything that is his becomes yours. You get the righteousness of God. Has that ever really overflowed your soul? You literally are as righteous as God himself is because you have his rightness. You know, we struggle to be right. We struggle to do right. You know, and you know how you do at it. You don't do so well. We, we're plagued by our failures. We, 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 we're aware of our limitations. And God says, here, let me do something for you. Let me show you what... And he gives you his righteousness. If you can ever get a hold of that and just rest in that, it gives you an identity as a child of God that will secure your life. And you've, you're, it's, it's secure. That's, a, that's phase one, justification, being declared righteous, acceptable, accepted in the beloved. But then that life that you get, you see, God doesn't just forgive your sins and give you his righteousness. He gives his righteousness so that he can then implant his life in you. And then his life begins to live all through time, every day, day in and day out. This is, you look around you, this is life. And, your experience, and that's what the Bible calls sanctification. That's phase two. That's salvation in time. Then you look to the future and you have phase three. That's glorification, the exaltation of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God's going to do in the, in the future when he brings to fruition what his purpose in your salvation, my salvation, he gets the whole body of Christ formed, what he's going to do with us in the ages to come. And that's what Ephesians is all about. And we've obtained this inheritance. And when he talks about obtaining it, he's not talking about me now trying to get justified. Oh, if I can just get God to justify me. Because he already did that in Christ instantly. He does that. I got nothing to do with that. It's not even talking about my salvation in, in time. It's talking about something that I'm going to possess in the ages to come. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Now the wrath that he's talking about, if you look back at verse number 3, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction, well, start back in verse 2. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. They're not going to escape the day of the Lord's wrath. Now in chapter 1, he, he talks about the, the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verse 10, the very last verse. He talks about he's delivered us from the wrath to come. I like that verse because we draw the chart, time passed, but now, ages to come, and it's easy to figure out where that verse fits on the chart, isn't it? <laughs> it fits in the scheme of, of Ephesians 2. Time passed, but now, then there's the ages to come, the wrath to come. You're talking about the day of the Lord's wrath. Sometimes we call it the tribulation period, that kind of thing. He's not appointed us to that, but to what? Obtain salvation. Salvation from what? From that wrath by our Lord Jesus Christ. So one of the things you're going to obtain as a member of the body of Christ is that future deliverance from that wrath to come on the earth. Come with me to 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Notice that that was God's, he, he says that he's not appointed us to wrath. Here's the appointment, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Now, before you get that, you see that first word in verse 13, but? That means I'm going to tell you something that's different from what I just told you. What he just told them about, if you go back to verse 13, 14, 15, I'm, I'm sorry, not, not, verse 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, that whole passage is an extended passage describing the career and the activity of the man of sin, the son of perdition. Now, those are the Bible terms for the man we call, often call the Antichrist. Um, he's called the Antichrist in the Bible, too. But the man of sin, the son of perdition, his career, his activity in the 
in the, in, in the future of seventh week of Daniel, the tribulation, that kind of thing. After describing that, by the way, there are three great passages in the Bible, three great places where the Antichrist career is described in detail. One by Daniel, one by John, one in the book of Daniel, one in the book of the Revelation, and then this passage by Paul. It's interesting that Paul would be one of the people that did that when Paul doesn't talk about, he's not proclaiming the prophetic program, but he describes it so that he can show you and me the contrast that we have from it. Follow that? There's the wrath to come. There's the Antichrist. We've not been appointed to that. We've been appointed to obtain deliverance from that, salvation from that. Now he describes the thing in detail because there were some people coming along to Thessalonica. By the way, back in verse 1 and verse 2, he says that they've even falsified Scripture, corrupted Scripture. You thought that didn't happen until today, did you? Writing letters, trying to convince these people that they're, that they're still a part of Israel's program and going back. The, right, the, 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 the clinching for right division started early. But, verse 13, we are bound to give thanks all the way to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Now that verse drives some people into fits of euphoric delirium when they want to uh, find a verse in the Scripture that teaches that election has to do with salvation. Did you know there's not one verse in the Bible that teaches that election has to do with someone's salvation from death, sin, and hell? You know, that's strange. People tell you that election is that before the foundation of the world, God decided some people would go to heaven and some people would go to hell. Election in the Bible has never, not one verse about that. The verse that talks about election and couples it with salvation is this verse, but the, salva well, the question is, what salvation are we talking about? You know, you can't just, you, gotta, you can't ignore the context. What is he talking about in the context here? He's talking about the tribulation out there. But, that thing out there, but God from the beginning, the beginning of what? Wouldn't that be a good question to ask? Well, you could say in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Is it that beginning? Well, that might be. You, you can find a bunch of beginnings in the Bible. So the question about what beginning it is, the context might help me. What an idea. Well, look at verse 14. Where unto he called you to this salvation that he's chosen you for from the beginning, he called you by our gospel. Now let me ask you a question. You think about this. Has Paul's gospel always been preached? No. Did there come a time when it began to be preached? Yeah. You follow that? So from the, in the context, the salvation is a salvation that began with the preaching and the ministry and the message of the Apostle Paul. So for, you with me? So from the time he began to preach, Paul began to preach his gospel of grace and the body of Christ began to be formed, there was a plan. And from the, the beginning of the dispensation of grace, God's plan has been that the body of Christ would be delivered from that wrath to come. That he would chosen you to salvation from all that stuff he's just talked about, the Antichrist and all that, through the sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he hath called you by our gospel. Now watch. To what? The obtaining, see that? Obtain what? Salvation from the wrath to come. That's the negative. We're not going to get that. But when we're saved from the wrath to come, what do we get? Isn't that wonderful? You see, what he did is he called you to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. Chapter 2, Second Timothy 2, verse 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Israel's Messiah, who is going to be the one who, who restores his, the authority of Christ in the earth, also has a plan revealed through Paul. 
wherein I suffer trouble, that is in my gospel. I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. I love that verse. I mean, Paul had a jail ministry. <laughs> Put him in jail, what did he do? He just said, that's good, man. I've got a captive audience here. I'll preach to him." You can't bind God's word. Therefore, verse 10, I endure all things for the elect's sake. Now, the elect, that's the body of Christ. Colossians 1.24, he says, I, 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 I suffer all these afflictions for the church. Now, why is he doing that? That they, the body of Christ, may obtain salvation. Now, what salvation are you going to obtain? You can obtain the salvation from the wrath to come unto eternal glory. We're talking about the future salvation. And see how he says it in verse 10? Obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with what? Eternal glory. You see, in him also we have obtained an inheritance. The inheritance has to do with our sharing in and participating in the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ in the heavenly places in the ages to come. Wow. I think that I'd say, whoa, man, that's something. It's all because you first trusted Christ. It starts there. If you don't trust Him, forget it. It's all because you trusted Christ. Not because of who you are. It's in Him. If you never trusted Him, that's, what you, that's where it starts. It doesn't start by joining the church, walking an aisle, shaking a hand, doing some religious activity. It starts by you having a personal relationship with the God of heaven, the creator of the universe. The one who loved you, died for you, paid for your sins, raised again, should give you his life. And he waits to do that today just by faith. And when he gives you that life, then he'll put it in you and live it through you day by day as you walk by faith in his word. If you've got a question about that, don't leave today without getting that settled, will you? Somebody sitting right next to you help you. If they can't, they can get you to somebody that can. Father, we thank you this morning for life in Christ Jesus and the privilege we have of using what looks to us as insignificant little things as we are for the glory of the Creator of heaven and earth. And we know it's by your grace and for your glory. In his name, amen.